everyone for being on. Katie, can the uh, public hear our starting of the meeting or do we have to take a step to let them in? They should be able to hear. Well, let, why don't we start up? We know we have board members that are going to be joining uh, us as the uh, few minutes roll past the hour, but good morning and happy new year to the community guests uh, attending our meeting this morning. Um, hello to Hassa, Housing Stability Strategic Advisors, board members, and thank you, Britta and host staff for your leadership um, throughout the last month and the many things that I'm sure, Britta, you're gonna share that host has been engaged in. Uh, I want to say congratulations to host and each of the community leaders that participated in the 2022 point in time count this past week. You know, it was a very cold morning and I appreciate everyone um, and uh, their commitment to ensuring that um, folks that are living on shelter are counted and are part of our process. I want to quickly roll, walk through what our agenda is. Uh, not sure if there, the next slide uh, shows the agenda, but I'll just talk through it quickly. We'll actually have a um, public comment session to kick off our meeting this morning. Um, community members will have uh, two minutes if they choose to, to present to the, uh, to the board and to host. Um, uh, we encourage uh, community members to uh, speak briefly if they have questions uh, of host or any of the Housing Stability Strategic Advisor Board members, please pose that question and we will hold an answer to that question till the end of the meeting. If you have a comment, make a brief comment uh, for about two minutes and then we'll move on to the next speaker and we'll continue on our agenda. We have this morning, uh, Brad Wining, um, who will speak to us on expanding housing affordability. And Brad, if I didn't pronounce your last name correctly, please correct me when we get to you on the agenda. Uh, as well as Annalise Hawk, I believe from CPD will be um, helping with the brief presentation on expanding housing affordability. The HASA board will have a discussion questions, Brad, for you and your team on some of the specifics of enhancing of housing affordability. Britta will have a brief uh, update from her post as a leader of HOST and all of the great things that HOST has been doing uh, throughout the last month. And then we'll have a discussion on communications priorities by Sabrina. Any additional questions from the amazing members of the HASA board? And then we'll adjourn the meeting. Uh, let me see if we have a quorum so we can approve the minutes. Let me go through. One, two, three, four, five, six. We do have a quorum. Um, Katie sent out the minutes of last month's meeting about a week or so ago. We'll give board members a moment if you didn't review those minutes, uh, take about a minute, take look them over, and then I'll ask for a motion to approve the minutes. And board members would just, a board member would just need to say, so moved, and then I'll ask for a second. If there's any discussion, hearing none, then we'll um, uh, ask each board member to come off of mute and say, yes, I approve, or no, I do not. So one minute to review the minutes. It was half a page, so it should not only take a second. Do I have a motion to accept the minutes from the December board meeting? I move to accept the minutes from the meeting. Thank a you second. so much. That was Randy. And who was yep. the second? Quika. Quika, thank you for the second. It's been moved and second. Any discussion on the minutes from the December board meeting? I usually encourage board members to look at, make sure if their names are listed present or absent, that that is correct. That's usually the one thing that may be a little bit off. Hearing no uh, questions, if board members don't mind coming off of mute, I'll ask all those in favor, say yes. 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 And yes for Daryl, all those opposed? Hearing none, any abstentions? Hearing none, so the minutes have been approved. So before we move to public comments, a, a quick update on board frequency. The board is only required to meet six times a year. Um, our board meetings are full of really important information uh, from host and from other organizations that are impacting um, the, the, the spectrum of housing stability from unsheltered to housing stability. 
oftentimes that does not provide the individual time for board members to discuss fully some of these important issues or even to have a dialogue around uh, possibilities or targets within our action plans um, that we just approved in January or even a five-year plan. Because of that, we are moving to have monthly board meetings, um, not just the six, but 10 board meetings um, for 2022. And that would uh, exclude meetings in July and meetings in December. The work of this board is so important. And it's also extremely important since we can't meet individually outside of these board meetings because of uh, open records rules and public comment rules for if the HUSA board is coming together to discuss these issues, we can only do these in meetings. We believe that, that adding those four meetings will provide ample time for us as a board to dig into our action planning, dig into the pillars, and dig into discussions like what Brad is gonna to present today to ensure that not only that we can inform um, the whole staff, but that community members can inform uh, host and, and HASA on a monthly basis. So those dates and times are gonna be forwarded uh, after this call. There'll be a discussion as to when the February and the April, et cetera, meetings are gonna be added. Each of you should already have the six meetings uh, that were on the, the uh, that are already planned on your calendar. If you have any questions about meetings and meeting times, um, please send me an email, um, CC Sabrina and Katie at the end of the call. But I know that with speaking with many of you, the need for us to have deeper dialogue on these important issues was important. And we think that adding those additional meetings um, will provide that opportunity. So for public comment, so Katie, I'm gonna need your support on this or whoever is listed as the host. We're providing up to two minutes for, uh, for community members that are attending to provide uh, comments to the board and to host, as well as if they have questions to pose those questions, we'll hold those questions to the end of the meeting and know that the call is being recorded. So we will have those full questions and if we can't answer them during this meeting, will provide a response at the end of the call. So if you are interested and you're a member of the public, the, you're not a member of the HASA board and you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Um, Katie will um, take you off of mute or the, the person who's listed as the host will take you off of mute. Introduce yourself if you're representing an organization, um, communicate which organization and provide your brief comment to the group as a whole, not to any specific member. And thank you in advance, I know we don't have to say this, for keeping it clean, uh, speaking specifically to issues and not to people. So Katie, uh, let's see, we have folks that are raising their hands. I see Gerald Horner. Um, can we uh, have Gerald jump off of mute and for two minutes provide a comment? You, Gerald, you should be able to. Um, I can do it as well. well. I got power. Let me see here. One second. Participants. Gerald, I'm trying to find you, so sorry about that. Ger Gerald should be able to unmute himself. Can you unmute yourself, Gerald? Let me see. There we go. Yep. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? I don't have a yep. very good connection. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Daryl and everyone. Uh, I asked the question back in December uh, at another meeting about the encampments, particularly in the downtown core. There's a number of us in the community, and I live in Five Points, that have been working with those uh, on the street in these encampments um, as volunteers, getting to know them, hearing their stories. My question is, we know that outreach teams go to these encampments in advance of the cleanups. My question is, do, does the, is data being collected on each individual? What type of data is it? What's the quality of it? How are we identifying um, folks' specific needs that are in these encampments, particularly those that we've, I'm into my second year now of really working closely with some of these individuals and we're seeing a lot of the same faces. So we're just curious, where that data is and, and uh, how effective the outreach is in moving folks uh, uh, out of these uh, in, uh, encampments here in downtown Denver. 
Hey, Gerald, it's great seeing you. Thank you for your question. Let me look to see if there's any other questions. If there are not, I think we can address Gerald's question um, directly. So let me look around the room. I'm not seeing any other hands being raised. Um, so is there a member from host or from our from the team that would love to uh, address uh, Gerald's question? And once again, thank you for all the work you do in Curtis Park. I know that for not just this past year, but for almost a decade or more, you and a team of folks have been working with unsheltered populations throughout the city. So thank you again for all of your leadership. Is there someone from the host staff that can answer Gerald's question specific to, is data being compiled? Are there cl clarity on who these folks, individuals are uh, that are unsheltered that we're contacting, whether it's with our outreach teams or the new EIT team. So um, Sabrina, from your perspective or anyone else from host that's on the call. Hi, this is Britta, um, Executive Director of the Department of Housing Stability. And we don't have our 2021 final reports, um, but from the Denver Street Outreach Collaborative that conducts um, individual outreach in 2020, we had one of our highest um, times of getting people connected to housing. There were 341 households that were connected to housing directly from the street. So that means they went to a stable housing um, outcome, which is uh, really great. And yes, we do enter information into the homeless management information system so that we have information. We also have the point in time study um, that also gives us some information as well. And so MDHI, the Metro Denver Homeless Initiative, just released the 2021 um, State of Homelessness Report, and it has some of the first information about annualized um, numbers of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness as well. So our information systems are starting to pay off in more rich data, and you can read that report. We'll be talking about it in my comments in just a little bit. I appreciate that, uh, Britta. Thank you. The, um, we know that a number of these individuals are struggling with severe um, mental health issues and addiction. Uh, and that's, I think, some of the greatest challenge we have. And our hope is that HOST will communicate out to the community, to residents and property owners on um, more specific tactics that are taken to address this uh, particular population that we see uh, truly chronically on the streets in our neighborhoods. So. Some new way of communicating, I think, what uh, to the broader public would be tremendously helpful. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gerald. And I know that host is beginning a process. And if you don't mind uh, putting pulling your raised hand down, because I'm going to ask you if you have another question. Um, but I know that host is looking at their dashboards as well. That's going to be public facing. And so as we go through the next upcoming months, we'll have discussions around those. And I think that's going to provide increased transparency as to how HOST is um, targeting um, the action plan outcomes, as well as the five-year plan. Let me see if there's additional questions from the public before we transition to Brad and team for the presentation of EHA. I'm looking, I'm not seeing any other hands. Katie, are you seeing any hands? Seeing none. Thank you Carol, so much. I just wanted to, Carol, I just wanted to share, this is Kristen Toombs with Division of Housing. I had to join late. I was on with the governor's office, so I'm here. Apologies to interrupt, but wanted to make sure you guys knew I was here. Thanks. Well, I think if the governor is having a meeting and you're there speaking on housing, I think that's important for you to be there. So thank you so much, Kristen, for coming in. You didn't miss too much. We had one public comment and we approved the minutes. So thank you for participating. Uh, let's turn it over uh, to Britta for any uh, her brief updates from the Executive Director of HOST. Thanks, Daryl, and thanks everyone for being here today. Again, Britta Fisher, uh, Chief Housing Officer for Denver and Executive Director of the Department of Housing Stability. Uh, just a few things that we want to draw your attention to. First, congratulations to Thomas Allen, who was reappointed by City Council, and to Marsha Brown and Melanie Lewis Dickerson, who were reappointed by Mayor Michael B. Hancock. So congratulations on your reappointments. All are three-year terms expiring December 1st, 2024. Nice round of applause. <laughs> 
Um, then I just also wanted to go a little bit uh, farther into some of the information that we actually just talked about in the public comment um, time. Uh, we also previously wrote you that we were having the point in time on Tuesday, as Daryl mentioned, thanking the volunteers. Um, I just want to echo that as well. It was a really early morning uh, for many people. There was some radio bonding happening, um, all sorts of good things. I want to thank um, Riley from our team and Chris Connor for uh, really helping to lead up those efforts, make maps, and make sure that we were strategic. I want to thank Anthony Rodriguez and Jennifer Bice and the data team for making sure that we had a really great plan. Um, overall, that was very data informed so that we could count everyone because everyone counts. Um, with that, I also want to uh, let you know that how it works is that beyond those observational um, assessments that were done on Tuesday, very early morning. We also have outreach teams that are out this week doing individual surveys that help uh, to affirm those numbers overall. And then MDHI will calculate the results and share them, but not until the summer. Uh, that's the lag that we usually see as they make sure that the uh, information is as accurate as possible, deduplicated, and um, that we have all the right information possible. So the point in time count numbers will be available in the summer. As you know uh, from our plan, we have a goal to reduce unsheltered homelessness by half, and so that point in time count will be a key data point in helping us to understand um, that, that uh, unsheltered count this year. Another report that I mentioned earlier is the State of Homelessness Report, also from Metro Denver Homeless Initiative. It basically has an annual look at the number of people experiencing homelessness, and it's done um, with a few different lenses. If you read the report, you'll see that they report out on the Homelessness Management Information System, Department of Education numbers. Um, so you can see kind of how we have different points of information that inform uh, our data environment. What it shows from HMIS is 32,233 people experiencing homelessness over the year. That was from July 1st through June 30th. So July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. That's up about 1,000 from the year prior. And the other thing that we know from that, um, that was in the pit uh, count that they talked about in the State of Homelessness report, um, from the 2021 PIT number uh, was a 99% increase in the region of people experiencing homelessness for the first time, so newly homeless. Um, some reporters got that mixed up and just thought it was a doubling of homelessness, so we've been um, making sure we correct that. It's a lot of data and information, and so MDHI is um, doing a lot of work along with our comms team to make sure people really understand uh, all of that information. Uh, they also, as I said earlier, had the first time that we had an annualized number of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness over the course of a year. And uh, that was more than 12,000 people. And that was looking at the last time someone had interacted uh, with the system and is not really a, like a nightly average, but is really that videotape look of where people uh, last experienced homelessness and interacted with our services and shelter system. Uh, overall, our historic numbers continue to trend that on any given night, it's closer to about 24% of people experiencing homelessness who are unsheltered. So beyond uh, that data and these reports, we have uh, had a lot going on, and I won't uh, talk about all of it, Daryl, because there's so much, but uh, some highlights just from this last week. We had three uh, big contracts move forward on Wednesday at Council Committee uh, for safe outdoor space with the Colorado Village Collaborative. There was a $3.9 million contract expansion that was um, put on, uh, put through toward a council vote. It will utilize ARPA dollars, which is the American Rescue Plan Act, to fund our safe outdoor spaces uh, through the end of 2022. So that is going from two uh, spaces to four and 100 households to um, more than 300. So we're excited to see that expansion of shelter alternatives and harm reduction here in our community. A little shout out to Quika. 
Uh, we also uh, had a motel short-term short uh, sheltering contract for families. This is um, a contract motel that we utilize to add to our capacity for family sheltering, and that was for a million dollars to expand um, our nights through 2022. And then uh, we also did an expansion of the street outreach um, contract. So it's the continuation of critical outreach, including behavioral health care providers, registered nurses, peer um, specialists who all will help to reach about 6,500 people um, in unsheltered experiences of homelessness over the next two years. So that's all really great work being done with our city council. And then I wanted to also talk about um, a, a really heartwarming story of this last week. In the Five Points neighborhood, there was the Charities House groundbreaking. And uh, if you do not know Pastor Bob and Miss Eddie Woolfolk, uh, they are just the people that Denver needs doing lots of things. They had a, a vision seven years ago with Miss Eddie and her legal pad saying, we need long-term housing. They had been doing transitional housing um, programs out of some small homes there and uh, are now, and now have broken the ground for a 36 unit supportive housing project. So that's really focused at people at 30% of area median income and below and exiting homelessness. And so it's something that's been a passion project of the Wolf folks, of their church, Agape Church, and uh, the Community Outreach Services Center. And so we're really uh, proud to see their perseverance and congratulate them. We also uh, invested uh, millions of dollars <laughs> alongside them to help realize that project. So. Uh, we have both services dollars and capital dollars into that project. Uh, the services will have a one to 10 staff to resident ratio and they'll have um, a 24 hour front desk uh, staffing as well. And referrals for the, this housing will go through one home, which is that uh, single point of entry uh, into our housing matches here in Denver. So congratulations to everyone who persevered and helped the Wolf folks uh, get to that day. All right, the last thing that I want to uh, mention is that we have a request for expressions of interest. It's basically like an RFI uh, in uh, city terms, and it's to build affordable housing and community services space. It's at 4995 Washington Street in Globeville. It's available on our website. I'm sure somebody from the team will toss that link for this REOI into the chat. Um, it was released earlier this week, and it's looking for expressions of interest by a qualified for-profit or non-profit um, developers who are wanting to enter into a partnership to provide affordable housing at this city-owned site and include a community services space. We purchased the site with community development block grant dollars uh, a couple years ago um, and knowing that it would be a key site uh, to add housing and community services in the Globeville neighborhood. And so we're very grateful to all the community members who gave us input as we put together this request for expression of interest and to our colleagues at the Division of Real Estate uh, who will manage that um, procurement and have posted that for people to respond to and want to make sure that you all were aware of that as well. With that, that's the end of my report for today. Thanks, Daryl. Thank you so much, Britta and team. Uh, lots of amazing stuff. Uh, I, I'll just kind of uh, also uh, applaud uh, the Charity House groundbreaking. Uh, it, it demonstrates con the commitment that the Wolf folks and their communities at Agave Church and, and others have had almost up to a decade of really continued dialogue with community and with um, um, the different departments within the city and county of Denver. I was able to attend their celebration and it was a celebration uh, of folks who truly should uh, be the focus of a lot of the work that we do. So thank you host for um, your leadership in that process and congratulations to all of the, uh, um, the individual community members that are going to benefit from that transition, from that process. And finally, the groundbreaking for Charity House, um, very close to Whittier where I live. And so it's good to see it and it'll be great watching the development of that project. So thank you again, Britt and team for everything that you've done. And thank you especially for Charity House groundbreaking. Uh, 
let's turn it over to Brad and um, Annalise for a presentation on expanding housing affordability. Great, thank you, Daryl. Good morning, strategic advisors. Uh, again, my name is Brad Weining, Director of Catalytic Partnerships, here today to talk to you about our Expanding Housing Affordability, or EHA, joint project, along with our, our peers at, at, in CPD. Annalise Hoke um, is the brilliant leader of this process. I serve as the primary host staff, and I'll be working through the presentation material today, and then um, Annalise can step in if I misstate. Otherwise, the two of us will then be able to hopefully answer whatever questions uh, may come up. And so... With that, um, the overview of what we want to kind of cover today is, again, a high level review of the expanding housing affordability policies. I say high level very intentionally for a couple of reasons. Um, one, there's a lot of, of detail in here and, and nuance to, to pick up on. Uh, two, we will be um, next week releasing um, a, a revised policy proposal, including uh, proposed language changes to the municipal code and the zoning code, which we'll um, get into a little bit more in detail as part of this process. But again, it's it's we're not we're not diving into every single nook and cranny of the of the policies. Um, we hope that that you and your and your networks will will do so over the coming months and work with us um, to make sure that it's you know as as effective and well designed as possible to ensure the better outcomes. Um, as a reminder, we did release our initial policy proposal back I think on October first in the fall and for three months really worked actively to ensure that as many members of our community were able to, to, to see it, review it, ask questions about it, um, and, and, and ultimately then submit their feedback and comments um, via a, a, a number of means, including comments on the website, formal letters, um, public meetings, et cetera. And we've spent the month of January really compiling all of that into um, into what you will see along with the rest of the city next week. So I'll talk through a little bit about kind of the process that led to that and then get into um, next steps and timeline for ultimate hopeful approval of these policy efforts um, and also talk a little bit about what, what we selfishly hope um, those of you uh, who serve in this body uh, might be able to do to, to help us um, in, in kind of the ultimate passage and success of, of this program. Go ahead, Katie. So again, as a reminder, expanding housing affordability boiled down to its essence are kind of a set of policies that are designed to ensure that as new housing is built, new affordable housing is also created, right? We've got to do more and better to keep up with the pace of, of what's going on in, in, in Denver and Colorado writ large. And we're excited about the possibilities that these policy efforts have to help do that and, and complement the programs that we're already undertaking, right? And so the, the two primary components of EHA are the uh, creation of a mandatory housing program or inclusion areas, oftentimes it's, it's known, but it's a mandatory housing program. And then an update to our existing linkage fee policies to again, complement um, the efforts and, and ultimately kind of combined, ensure that we could, we do a better job of keeping up with, with, with the pace and demand and try to catch up with what we know to be a, a great need. Go ahead, Katie. Um, so again, quickly, the two components, mandatory or inclusionary housing, will require that a portion of all new multifamily housing that is built uh, be restricted, affordable, and, and, and we also have, along with that, some incentives to help ensure that the market can, can help us in supporting um, the inclusion of these types of units. And then the other component for all properties for, for whom the mandatory housing um, program does not apply will be still subject to the linkage fee. Um, which ties the impacts of new development um, to the need for kind of induced demand for affordable housing. And, and these fees, you know, play a critical role along with many of our other funding sources in, in funding the, the, the creation of, of new affordable housing units throughout the city, like Charity House, the ones you heard, right? These are the kinds of programs that the linkage fee helps support. Go ahead. Um, so generally applicability wise, again, we're, what we're proposing is that all residential developments of 10 or more units will be subject to mandatory housing. Um, there, there are alongside their kind of obligations because we have to as part of the state bill that enabled us to be able to um, incorporate this program, alternative compliance options, which we'll, we can talk through a little bit. And also a set of incentives available to help again, ensure that our, the success of our primary goal, which is to create a kind of modest but steady stream of 
of affordable housing options interspersed among and between um, all the great market rate development that's going on throughout the city. Um, up to the left and the right on the slide are, are kind of the, the, the rest, the balance, frankly, of, of real estate development opportunities, all of which will, again, um, pay a fee on a per square foot basis for new development that um, serves as a, uh, again, a pot of money that helps host achieve our overall goals for, for this year and for the, in our five-year strategic plan. Go ahead, Katie. Again, I think, you know, we, we often fall into the habit in, in our world of getting a little bit too into the kind of weeds and numbers and, and AMIs. And this is just, we try to use this slide as a reminder that at the end of the day, this is about people, individuals, contributors to our, to our economy and to our community that we're trying to help, you know, solve for who have um, housing needs. And so this is, again, a little bit hard to follow, but it's, it's meant to kind of show that, you know, there's a critical, increasingly growing subset of our population who is struggling to be able to make sense of living in Denver, and we need them to be part of our community. And that's why we're trying to advance and, and, and address these policy solutions to complement what we're already working on. I think there may be some um, animation associated with this slide, Katie. So I don't know, try to click in there. There we go. So again, um, the idea being that kind of on the, on, the, on, the, on the left side of the slide where the lowest income um, individuals live, we have a, a, a suite of resources that, you know, that we regularly invest in and promote as, as part of host. On the right, certainly there's you know, market rate housing that serves you know, a, an increasingly affluent part of our population. And really where, where this program is trying to complement and implement and, and, and add solutions is really in that middle section where these are kind of you know, folks who are earning in the whatever, 35 to $60,000 range, depending on household size, right? Those who have you know, decent, you know, decent paying jobs, but not enough to increasingly afford um, the cost to live in, in this city. And so this is, the slide is meant to just kind of illustrate that, that in the day we're talking about you know, human beings and members of our community that deserve to be our neighbors. Go ahead. And again, it's also important whenever we're talking in front of um, groups like yours, or frankly, any, any, any group to ensure that, it, you know, while it's easy to focus on and try to kind of project your, your desires onto this, this program, it is one tool, one policy, one addition to our, um, our suite of tools to help kind of holistically address the scale of the challenge, right? So this is not a panacea, it's not meant to be, we know that. However, it is a new tool. It's designed in its nature to be complementary to all the other great stuff that HOST is already doing. You just heard Britta walk through at a high level many of the most current efforts. You can see on the slide here, we don't need to dive into the numbers, but I think you all well know, I think all the different efforts and outcomes that, that we have achieved in the past years and that we're you know seeking to achieve even greater numbers in the years to come. And so, um, this is something that's, again, meant to, to complement all of our existing efforts, not replace, um, not overshadow by any stretch, but, but to kind of round out, I would say, um, our, our, our tools that are available to us. Katie, go ahead. So again, uh, we did publish kind of a, a, a draft policy proposal document back in October, laying out the details of both the mandatory housing components as well as the linkage fee updates and then um but even prior to that release right we've been for over a year kind of having these conversations and talking with community with development members with neighborhood groups with advocacy organizations around you know what we intend to do and and what thoughts they have on how we might be able to do it better right and so we've had a number of different mediums for for input including open houses um, you know, council budget and policy meetings, planning board meetings. We have our own formal advisory committee for the for the process that meets regularly, and then um, a, a ton of kind of one on one to group conversations with with community groups, industry organizations, um, RNOs, neighborhood groups, advocacy organizations, etc., um, to try to get you know meet them where they're at and and get feedback in, in a place that's comfortable and in the format that's comfortable for them. Um, we've also had kind of three citywide community office hours where, you know, Annalise and I make ourselves available. And those have been some of, frankly, the most fun conversations because we never know who's going to show up. But it's always a robust um, set of feedbacks and conversations that we have. And, and we'll intend to do more of those in, in the weeks and months upcoming. And then as well as some kind of specific focus groups where we might have focused on one individual component or topic of some of these policies. And all of these have kind of wrapped up. Um, 
through December, which we asked everybody to kind of get their formal comments in by December so that we had, again, the month of January um, to, to kind of digest, coordinate, and, and try to figure out, you know, based on what we're hearing, how can we incorporate, you know, tweaks, changes, adjustments throughout the policies to ensure that they are responsive to what we're hearing, to concerns that we're hearing from all sides, and, and ultimately most responsive to um, the needs of the community to ensure that it's effective in, again, working within the market to create affordable housing opportunities. Go ahead, Katie. If you don't need to uh, read this slide, but we got a lot of robust, you know, forms of feedback, over 100 different formats, a lot of individual comments through the website, several questions that came in through the website, um, and a total of eight kind of formal, thoughtful letters from a variety of both industry groups and community and advocacy organizations um, that were that were very helpful for us in, in again, learning what the concerns are and trying to, and, and, and frankly, what people are excited about as well, in order to ensure that that, that we have a, a robust set of policies. These conversations continue to be ongoing. We're not done yet, as we'll talk through, but um, hopefully what is released next week um, will, will represent our, our really sincere efforts in trying to address as much as we can the ideas, concerns, suggestions, recommendations that we, that we heard throughout this process. That all the small text is just a list of all the different organizations who were represented as part of those formal letters. Oh, animation. Anyways, um, again, I think at a very high level, right, to, in an attempt to summarize the feedback we got, there's really, you know, broad support for our efforts. Everybody understands the challenge that we're, that we're facing, that we've got to find new and creative ways to do more to complement what we're already doing with our, you know, robust but still, you know, limited and inadequate resources to meet the scale of the challenge, right? And so um, we were pleased to see that, you know, even those who, who this might, you know, impact, impact most, um, in terms of you know their their financial abilities, like developers understood why we're why we're doing this, and are and are, and are willing to work with us on on making sure that it's just a, it's a policy that that they can work within and and and, and create units as designed. Um, you, you know, I think generally from to summarize the impact or the the feedback that we received from community and advocacy organizations, you know, I felt like. You know we're not we're not pushing far enough with some of the policies. These are our, our requirements are are too modest and insufficient to, to meet the needs. On the flip side, right, a lot of industry organizations, individuals felt that you know the, these requirements were were, were, were onerous and, and were going to ultimately add cost to market rate homes and rents and and perhaps you know exacerbate the the issue, right? And so on the one on the one hand, they're not necessarily in, in full opposition, but we know that maybe we're, we're close to the right balance. If, if, if some feel like we're not doing enough and others feel like we're doing too much, maybe we're, we're close, right? But that's a, and we'll get into detail in the next slides, Katie, on a little bit more of kind of the specific requests. So from the community groups, some of the requests specifically that we heard via those letters and in comments and conversations were really looking to, um, you know, increase the linkage fees, which we are doing across the board, especially focusing on, Kind of um, scrapes of, of smaller existing more modest homes and replacement with much larger um, newer homes which is we're well aware a big part of the concern in the communities um, and, and so we've, we've we've made some some slight tweaks to try to adjust that again you know this is this is one policy and probably isn't the most appropriate to address that holistically but we recognize that's a challenge and we're trying to do what we can to be responsive um, really wanted to see the funds that we do generate via the linkage fee and, and, and other you know, fee and lieu programs as part of the mandatory to really invest in the programs and services to serve um, our lowest income households. Um, we know that's where the greatest need is. That's clear in our strategic plan. And uh, hopefully it'll be clear that, that we do intend to you know, invest resources to that end as part of our update. Um, one in the community wanted to see stronger consideration um, for and systems be put in place for residents at risk of involuntary displacement. And again, you know, hear that loud and clear, try to incorporate some tweaks and adjustments and modifications to ensure that this tool does what it can and also best pairs with and complements other tools and resources like um, the host prioritization policy that we are working on kind of simultaneously and collaboratively to make sure that the two of them speak and work well together um, to help address, you know, what is a, a primary concern of a lot of organizations and individuals um, in terms of people just being displaced from their neighborhoods. 
Um, a request also to to see you know more affordable housing created as part of this process and to remove um, barriers to creating more affordable housing. And again, you know, the, there's only so much this policy set can do, but we're trying to be um, responsive as much as we can within the policy adjustments that we're creating in order to do so. And then finally, um, you know, a, a desire for greater accountability, tracking and transparency on the project incomes. And this is one that, you know, I think the community and the um, development industry both agree on. And we hear loud and clear, and it's not just unique to this particular effort, right? You heard, you heard Britta, we've already conversations today around, around data, our update to our database. This is you know, one part of that, but we are, you know, intent on, on, on making a, a, a more robust, better, easier to follow, easier to use reporting process um, for all of our different programs, including the outcomes of expanding housing affordability so that we know to what extent this is being successful in meeting our goals or if we need to make adjustments, you know, a year or two into it. From the industry side, Katie, if you wouldn't mind adv advancing. Um, from a different, you know, set of perspective that kind of, again, reduce barriers to the development and, and create and increasing the overall supply of just housing generally, right? We still have a kind of demand and supply imbalance and we need to, to kind of come up with other supply side tools rather than, you know, coming out with, with, with sticks to, to require mandatory affordable housing, right? That's been a kind of resounding theme from the industry and, and we hear them. And again, we wanna make sure that while we, we meet our goals, we can't overstep with the requirements because if, without, market rate housing being developed, we aren't going to get affordable housing and we aren't going to get you know, linkage fee dollars. And so we have to keep that in mind. Economic feasibility is a, is a big part of what we're proposing. They also wanna see enhanced incentives, right? To minimize the, the impacts of what we're asking them to do or requiring them to do um, to help kind of offset some or all of, of the costs associated with restricting a portion of their units to being affordable or paying a higher linkage fee. It's a... Um, this is coming at a time where costs are, are, are high and elevated as well. There are a number of you know, consistent and ongoing COVID impacts, particularly to non-residential development that need to be kind of incorporated. And so they, while they understand why and, 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 and what we wanna do in terms of increasing the linkage fee, they've asked us to kind of phase in the increases so that we, the market has time to work through the other externalities like COVID that it's working through. And so again, we're trying to be responsive to, to that in our, in our updated policy efforts as well. Um, impacts on ownership in particular, and um, in, in some of our high cost areas like downtown and Cherry Creek, we have higher expectations. The industry was, was concerned with, with, with those two. They could probably be listed as separate bullet points, frankly, because they're a little bit different, but it's difficult to create multifamily ownership opportunities in the state for a variety of, of reasons. We're not building it at the scale that, that we need it. And so adding an additional set of, of, of requirements is, is challenging for particularly the ownership set of, of new development. And then, you know, high cost areas are just that. It tends to be where you need to have concrete and steel and higher and, and structured parking. And, you know, the, the costs are, 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 are high in those communities and it's harder to, for the industry to, to offset. We have, economic feasibility analysis that kind of says differently. But again, this was this was a response that we heard quite a bit from the industry. And then finally, um, you know, a resounding theme was that that, you know, that the, the development process, the permitting process, site planning processes are all taking longer than they than they typically have because of the the continued boom that we're seeing, particularly on the residential side. And it's and and, and they're and they're frustrated that it's taking as long as it is and they want to know what we can do within this policy to try to help streamline and create some certainties of processes. And, and again, you know, the, there's that, that, that is a challenge that CBD is well aware of and are working on throughout across the board. There are some things we're trying to bake into these policy programs to help address that. But um, it's, it's another theme that we, we hope we're as responsive as we can be within the, the kind of confines of these policies. Go ahead, Katie. So again, Annalise and I and a, and, a, and a bunch of our colleagues have been hard at work this month in um, incorporating all of this great feedback into a revised policy approach. You'll see that we're kind of in that towards the right end of, of this process, um, quarter four, 21 and quarter one, 22, where we're really working on confirming the policy alternatives and drafting the documentation that's going to be released next week. 
um, for, for review. And again, we're at the end of the day targeting um, ultimate adoption and approval um, in, in the second quarter of this year. And a little bit more details of what that looks like, I think Katie is on our next slide. So again, um, you know, keep your eyes out next week um, for, for a, a fresh revised draft of all the components of these policies. Um, releasing it citywide, we'll, we'll be engaging with all the you know, organizations we've engaged with thus far, as well as new organizations and entities who show interest and want to know more about it or have questions about it. February and March is really a big public outreach, engagement, commenting push. Um, we'll also be making kind of updates to council um, committees, a LUTI throughout the month of February. We'll also be kind of an informational item in front of planning board. All of those are all public meetings, as well as our EHA advisory committee. So lots of, of opportunity um, to, to engage. And all of these dates, by the way, um, I think, I believe are, will be soon posted to the EHA project website, which is linked um, in this slide that I believe you guys will be receiving um, after this meeting. And then kind of the ideas, one more round of, of, of tweaks and changes based on the feedback that we're getting in February and March, such that we have a, a final or very near final set of um, you know, policy zoning code, municipal code, changes, rules and regs as well to be introduced through our formal legislative review process, which again will involve council, council committees and planning board. The idea being that we're, we're, we're targeting formal council adoption um, in, in early June of, of this year. And so that's really uh, a high level summary of all the next steps. Katie, I think the next slide is, um, and hopefully our last slide is really just, you know, our our requests of you, right? And so you guys bring a breadth of, of experience, lived experience, housing expertise, knowledge, influence networks, and, and, and we see you as a very important body in, in making sure that we get this policy correct and then we get it adopted, right? And so the first ask is that all of you review what's in it, um, you know, come come back to Annalisa and me with any questions or concerns or ideas that you might have. But more importantly, share it with your networks, making sure that everybody is aware of, of what we're doing here, why we're doing it, um, and, and when we're trying to do it, such that, um, you know, ultimately the idea is that we need your help in, in getting support from the community and enthusiasm for these policy efforts so that host and CPD can be successful in the, in the kind of legislative review process and adopting um, what we believe to be a, a much needed and exciting set of policy tools to advance our efforts. And, you know, more specifically, especially as we get into the legislative review process, you know, help us advocate for it, um, write letters of support, provide testimony for planning board and, and city council, you know, record videos, tell your stories, um, talk about how this relates to you or your friends or your household or your neighborhood or your organization, um, you know, it, Again, it's all about, at the end of the day, people and, and, and wanting to provide more resources and tools. And the more the council hears um, support, the more likely they are going to be to, to pass these efforts. And so again, um, you know, we look forward to working with all of you. I see lots of hands popping up. Um, happy to have a conversation now with questions or comments or answers as we can. Um, but again, you know, we'd love your support in, in getting this ultimately adopted and approved. So thank hey, you. Brad and Annalise, thank you so much for your presentation. I know there's a lot of information yes. for you to be able to go through it as quickly as you did. Thank you again. I know we have uh, tons of hands up for questions. So why don't I, now first, I, let me look here. I thought I saw Sabrina's hand. I was going to do that. Then I was going to turn to the board because we have a board process for questions. So I did have my hand up. I just wanted to let you all know that um, at, at we wanted to give you this presentation today first before we give you kind of the high level talking points that we've put together about this um, entire program that, that Brad just went through um, and the asks that we have of you. So we'll, we will be following up with kind of a toolkit for you to be able to use as you go out into the community and try to talk about um, expanding housing affordability. And then also um, would love to talk with any of you who are interested in uh, helping us uh, create some videos and do some other materials that we're going to be sharing with the community as well as um, in our public meetings that will be coming up in February and March. All of that is going to be coming out on February 2nd with the um, website updates and all of those things. So we'll have those for you um, and happy to accommodate any specific requests you have in that regard. 
And, and, and Daryl, as we get to questions, uh, I want to note that that Annalise does have to depart at 11 for uh, a council briefing on this very topic. And so I guess if any of those of you that have hands up that you think are, are kind of specific to um, planning department type questions um, you know, that the Annalise may be more appropriate to answer, I'd like to you know, kind of prioritize those in the seven minutes we, we have her with us. So I'm seeing hands up anyone specific to um, CPD questions, or even if I'm not seeing anyone coming off mute, I'll go first to Maria uh, for your question. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. So I, I do want to make sure Annalise hears me. Um, I When I was looking, thank you, Brad and Annalise, so much for pulling this together. I um, When I noticed the comments that you know, you collected. I did send um, some comments. I didn't see us on there. So I'm hoping you got them. <laughs> I can resend them to you as well. But it really has to do with the slide that um, you showed, Brad, about um, the one to nine unit area that, you know, it only has in linkage fees included. And one of the comments we made in our letter were the fact that, um, you know, we are all trying to make sure our city is more inclusive and that um, we're addressing equity issues of where affordable housing is throughout our city, including lower density areas. And what we were talking about in our letter, in our comment letter, was the idea of, you know, that missing middle housing that could fit within the form of three stories in some of these lower density, quote unquote, higher opportunity um, neighborhoods. Um, where incentives could help um, make it affordable. You know, you know, you talked about that balance yeah. of market and affordability. And I just wanted to make sure that I stated that in case it, you know, our letter didn't make it through as you're considering this, because um, not including the additional incentives at the one to nine level um, could make it difficult for those opportunities that we could do infill in some of these neighborhoods in a way that's you know, architect, you know, is within the architectural yeah. context. So yeah. you can answer, yeah, because yeah, maybe yeah, you have and I'll it. speak to that one because it does have to do more. I will note that um, you did receive your comment. And I think, sorry, okay, I good. flagged <laughs> Brad to delete that page just because I, I we had missed it, but. It's fine, um, I just want to make sure you got it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And and I know that when we connected to, um, with your organization last fall um, to, this was a similar comment. And mm -hmm. I think it's a really important to note that right now we are really focused on um, creating a system that's leveraging market-based opportunities kind of based off of generally existing entitlement. And then where we have citywide guidance to um, increase growth and density. So in alignment with our growth strategy, which is in kind of mixed use and multi unit zone districts, that's where we're focusing our um, height incentives. It's important to note that height are only one of the incentives being deployed. What though you're speaking to about density incentives for one to nine um, is really a conversation to be had continuing with CPD leadership and council members. Um, Blueprint Denver does set up guidance to talk about increasing and diversifying the, the types and kind of number of housing that can be permitted in our traditionally single unit neighborhoods. Um, but that is really a big project that has substantially different impacts than this topic here. And so we know that that warrants continued community conversation um, with our, our neighborhoods. And so that is not a part of the um, proposal to, to say that if you have an existing two unit um, zoning that you can now do multi-unit um, if you're providing affordable. We do see that you know provision being explored in areas like Minneapolis and Portland and it is something that we certainly have citywide guidance for but is really outside of the scope of this project. But I guess my, here's my question and I hope I'm not speaking out of <laughs> our turn, but I mean, if, even if it's within the allowed form, if you're instead of, um, you know, it being, uh, well, I guess that that is, is exactly. Yeah, what and Maria, I'm happy to continue. Yeah, let's do it offline. I want to make sure yep. I understand we'll it yep. so that we know. Yep, yep. I know you have to hop off too. So. No, you're good, but I, I know it's someone fun. else's opportunity, but thank you. And Annalise, um, to, to add to Maria's piece, don't need to respond to it, but let's make sure that that question, that point is listed in kind of the comments. I think that's an important piece because I've had several folks reach out to me on that as well. So if we can, even though it's out of scope for this, I think many touch points of this being brought forward um, 
it's going to be helpful. Yeah, so when it, we in present our, this in our more detailed appendix of summary, we do include comments that such okay. as these that are outside of the scope of the project, so they are recorded. We're just keeping it very high level today, so appreciate that. Perfect. And at least when you need to drop, drop. Um, I'm going to move Thank to you. Quika. Thank you, Daryl. Um, yeah, my question was uh, kind of in, in regard to uh, the middle portion of that particular slide is the fee, well, maybe not that, that slide, but the fee in lieu of uh, for developers. And um, do, are we tracking historically like the percentage of developers that have utilized that fee in lieu of? And what, how quickly also like a second part is that fee being turned around into market, or I mean, affordable housing units? So it's important to note that this is an entirely new system that we are creating. So um, the only kind of historical data that we have in terms of developer choice into the fee and lieu is based off of the former IHO. Um, and that one had a lot of lessons learned and refinements that were made to that prior fee and lieu. That being said, we've kind of used feasibility to help inform our policy priorities. And so our policy priority is to create mixed income housing um, and to create new affordable housing with it. Fee and lieu is helpful and it, it does create affordable housing, but it just kind of continues to perpetuate the segregation that we commonly see. And so we've used the financial analysis to help us calibrate that fee and lieu at a point that it's going to be much more of a financial hit to the developer than building those affordable units on site. So what we do anticipate is that it will be a much smaller segment of developers opting into paying the fee and lieu. Um, we are using the fee and lieu as part of an obligation to incentives that we're providing that would would provide permit fee reductions to both affordable projects um, to reduce that down. But if there's funding in excess of it, then they could be used that following year as well. So, um, you know, given the implementation timeline, it's unlikely that we'll see dollars generated in the next um, year or two. But after that, we should have a lot more data and we, we plan to be reporting that out annually. So there's transparency and, and accountability in the expectations of those funds. Great, and I, and I know that as a follow-up, I know that those funds go into an, a trust. Um, do we have any idea um, of what the, are those utilized for new developments or are they utilized to subsidize existing developments so that those turn into affordable units at the same time that those new units are created? Sure, I, I can take, Annalise, I know you gotta go. So thank you all, I'll try to take this long. Good question, and one that we um, have been going back and forth on a lot. And again, I think hopefully you'll you'll see our, our attempt um, at, at codifying our intent um, in, in the revised municipal code language. But effectively, the idea is that Fee and lieu dollars can be utilized for, yes, creation of new affordable housing, but also for funding, um, preservation, um, especially in neighborhoods vulnerable to displacement. You'll also see our effort to kind of prioritize those dollars. I mean, first and foremost, as Annalise mentioned, they need to be used to kind of fund the monetary components of the incentives like um, modest fee waivers and stuff like that. But after that, we do very much intend to prioritize the use of those dollars, especially those that are um, received from transactions, you know, in neighborhood defined as vulnerable to displacement by data to ensure that we're prioritizing the use of those dollars for stabilization and preservation efforts in those same sub subset of neighborhoods, right? So we're, we're trying to you know, use those dollars as flexibly and responsibly as we can um, to, to address you know, kind of localized needs as much as we can. Great, and then I'm gonna finish up with this last follow-up um, is, is there, you know, obviously we saw that the fee and lieu was being used, you know, more often than we had anticipated, right? Um, are there any safety nets for if we start seeing that trend again? Is there a cap? Is there um, something we can do to, instead of learning our lesson again, is there sure. something we can do to prevent well, that? So that there, there is not a cap. And as a reminder, right, one of the obligations that any jurisdiction pursuing um, a program like this via House Bill 1117 does have to provide alternatives to creating units on site. So we, we have to be responsive to make sure that we are you know, justified in, in administering this program. The easiest and simplest way to do that is a fee in lieu. Although you will see that the fees in lieu that we are talking about here are, are three and four times higher than, than they were in, in the prior kind of iteration of inclusionary housing, which applied to a much smaller subset of development. And so, again, as Annalise mentioned, our intent is very much to kind of incentivize when we can 
the what we really want to see, which is the integration of mixed income um, affordable units interspersed and market rate developments, right? That's our top policy priority and our and our options are calibrated thusly. But we do have to provide options. Fee and lieu is one that we are providing. And again, you know, we're we have me me mechanisms to invest those dollars, but we do believe that, and, and we've kind of confirmed this with conversations with developers that you know they're 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 much more onerous this time around and, and much more painful um, from an economic perspective to pay the fee. But 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 we can't, I mean, that's why we're doing this data, right? That's why we're, we're, we're monitoring. And so if, if everybody is writing checks, then you know we have the ability to, to, to adjust and tweak and modify in the coming years. But again, we don't believe that will be the case. Hey, Brad, thanks for that question, that answer. Randy, I'm gonna to come to you next and then Masha, but I wanna do a, not a follow-up, but maybe a uh, for you to not provide clarification now, but for us to actually have that information as you're going through your February community input pieces specific to the data. Um, what are the steps that you, CBD and host are doing to ensure that there's transparency in kind of the question that Quika asked. Okay. So for example, if we're seeing 60%, no matter how much of the pain folks are feeling, if developers identify that, hey, market rate is more advantageous for us long-term, we're gonna pay the fee. I don't care if it's you know doubling, tripling what mm -hmm. IH did in the past. Is that transparency gonna be baked into the dashboards that host is building? How soon or how clear will community have access to that? So Quika and other folks can look in and say, hey, we're almost at 60% of developers doing this. We're at 35%, some of that information. So no need to answer, Brad, but I think that's essential and important when we talk about transparency as far as looking through this through the eyes of equity. Yep, and we've heard that loud and clear. Thank you, Daryl. Hey, Randy, I see your hands up. And uh, Maria, if you are if you don't have another question, if you don't mind lowering your hand, because I'm gonna call on you again if, I, if you with your hands up. So um, Randy and then uh, Marsha. Thank you. Hi, Brad. Good to see hey, you. And thank you for this today. Um, I'm looking at your expanding housing affordability proposed policy approach. I read through it some last night. And on page 16 of that, it talks a lot about the on-site affordability requirements. And I'm seeing a lot of 50, 60, 70, 80 percent AMI why is there nothing in here addressing the zero to 30% AMI? And then I have a part two of that question too. Sure. So I, in the simplest form of your answer, Randy, it's, it's, it's economic feasibility where we believe, you know, we can pull the market our direction, right? There's to, to provide housing for, for much lower than that really requires subsidy from the state, from, from federal government and from host. And so the idea is to take, you know, resource, pressure on those resources allow us to invest our resources more deeply to serve where we know greater needs to be. That said, you will see a couple of tweaks again in, in the revised version of that document that you'll see next week, where we're allowing for some um, income averaging as well as one of the options, right? And so you're kind of able within the property to cross subsidize and do you know some some higher AMI units in order to be able to also serve 30, 40, and 50 percent AMI type units. And so again, it's 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 it has to still work within market feasibility, right? And if we ask too much, we don't get any housing and therefore we don't get any affordable housing alongside it. And so it's it's been a big guiding principle of of our efforts. Um, but it's a it's a request and a and a concern that a lot of voiced. And again, we're we're doing what we can to um, incorporate it into this limited policy tool. Um, but I think, you know, we have a lot of resources more than we ever have to to invest in in the housing solutions for the, the lower income population among us. Okay, thank you. Brad, do you um, want to talk a little bit about how host is covering that as well? And that that's part of the thinking there? You talked about it a little earlier in the presentation, but... I'm not sure I understand what you're trying to say, Sabrina, sorry. Um, I think just that part of the discussion with EHA has also been that um, many of hosts programs cover that zero to 30% AMI. And right. so that was the slide that Brad showed earlier where it was showing that EHA is kind of more yeah. the middle AMI as opposed to the lower end. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I had attempted to, to say that earlier, but yes, I mean, Sabrina's right that we've got tools and resources. And if you look at our budget for next year, over 50% of it is devoted to, you know, kind of housing and services for 
kind of our lowest income and, and, and most needy population, right? And so it's, it, we're keenly aware that that's where the greatest need continues to be. We want to invest the dollars and resources where they're most needed. And I, our hope is that with this policy tool, we'll be able to introduce more units without having to invest capital resources, right? In that kind of 50 to 60 and 70, 80% AMI arena to ensure that the dollars that we are investing can be you know, utilized where they're most needed. Um, I understand. Yeah. I understand. And Andy, you. you had a second part to your question. You said, "Yeah." Um, <clears throat> at the end, there you said you talked about uh, wanting us to go out and um, advocate for this to our communities. And as you know, I'm part of the disability community, and I've been hearing a lot from my former colleagues at Atlantis and at the um, Colorado Cross Disability Coalition that there's still a huge, huge need for more housing for people with disabilities. Um, I, I think I really wish that's something that you guys would look at, um, having a larger percentage, whatever requirement um, of, of apartments that would be accessible, whether that's through universal design or just designated um, accessible apartments. So for me to go to my community and sell this. I didn't. I wasn't able to read the whole thing, but I, the, as much as I read, I really saw no mention of accessibility. That, that, that's fair, Randy. And, and yes, I'm, I'm aware. And you're, you know, thank you for your continued um, vocalization of, of these issues. Again, I, I, I don't want it to sound like a cop out, right? But that, that those issues are really better addressed in kind of zoning, or I'm sorry, well, zoning certainly to some extent, but building code updates and advancements. And I know we're working on all of those things concurrently, um, you know, again, addressing, trying to address that directly as part of this set of policy tools is inadequate, right, to get to the scale of, of the need. Um, you know, so all of the, all of the requirements that are, that are on buildings in terms of design, universal design, um, ADA accessibility are, are certainly in play, right, and, 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 and will continue to drive outcomes in that re regard, both for market rate and, and affordable, but you're correct that there's, nothing specific within these policies to kind of address. And I don't believe that it, it would be an effective kind of mechanism via these policies to address, I think, Randy, your, your broader concerns. Um, and I'm sorry, that's probably an inadequate answer, but I think that's the, that's the reality. Yeah, the, the one thing that we find um, is, I mean, we love the ADA. The ADA was a wonderful law, but it does not go far enough. And I, I don't know, where we would go to the city to encourage them to use best practices rather than just what's required, but to be able to expand. Because that's our, the biggest problem is people say they can find affordable housing, but they can't get in the door with their wheelchair um, just because there's not enough. I understand, Randy, man, but I believe that would ultimately be in kind of our, our, our building code, but I'm, I, I will kind of take it upon myself to track down and, and, and find, you know, the, the right individual or, or, or place within our kind of city structure to, to continue to push. And, and Randy, thank you for your points on that. And, and Brad, I'll just share very quickly on this and then I'll move to Masha for a question and see if there's any other board members. And I have one question after Masha, but specific to the equity lens when it comes to all of these um, opportunities, obviously EHA is not gonna hit on all of these. There are going to be some building specific pieces or some stuff already in blueprint. There's already stuff within the five-year plan for, um, for, for host. Is there an equity um, dialogue or equity uh, narrative that EHA can have in the preamble of this proposal? Uh, I think it's essential because folks are going to be looking for their communities to be impacted by this because it's a state law. And they're going to say, my community is not mentioned in here, so we're not happy with this. So I think that's going to reduce some of these questions and impacts as it goes to committee for council. If you at least up front consider having kind of equity premise and communicate the holistic approach that a city is taking when it impacts communities of, that are marginalized, this plan does not touch those. However, these plans may and, and, and could and then have links to them. Don't want to add more work to you. Don't know what your folks are writing this up will say. I do know the questions will continue on these equity targets uh, because they're not explicit within this plan. So really no comment needed, Brad, but I just think it may be helpful up front to be direct on these and maybe have an equity line in your narrative as you begin this dialogue. 
Good suggestion, Daryl. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm um, noted. Hey, Marsha, and then Thomas, I see your hand up as well. And then we're going to, now, I know, Sabrina, we have a 15 or 10 minutes for communicate communications updates. If we have board questions, I'm going to ask if you're comfortable with us continuing to the end of the meeting, and then you have maybe a shorter piece for communication. I'm fine with that. Uh, Marsha, what questions do you have? Uh, thank you so much, um, Daryl, for, for allowing me the opportunity. Brad, what if you and Annalise did an amazing job reflecting what true community looks like in your scale for AMI, um, as it is not um, been, you know, highly recommended or seen before. It just always includes a family of four. The numbers are always, you know, set in, in silent. You're like, well, where do I fit in? And you really hit the, the nail on the target, um, representing all kinds of family structure, all kinds of individuals that may experience homelessness or looking for affordable housing. So I wanted to just simply say thank you for that. I've been waiting to see more than just a whole family of four kids and, and you know, someone like myself left out in um, in the picture. So I, I really appreciate that and, and associating the residents with being people. We're not numbers. This, this is huge and it's a huge um, importance for me to have this opportunity to address something like this. Um, I've read over, I reviewed the proposal um, summary, and I was just trying to understand. I have two questions. One, Quika had hit on a little bit, and Daryl had mentioned about, but I really wanted to um, ask if the linkage fees is associated or directly impacted from the market rate in which um, that development is being developed. So instead of just having a set linkage fee, is there, you know, if you're building in Cherry Creek and um, there's not enough affordable units there, that uh, linkage fee or um, the fee in lieu, um, is that assigned based on the market rate where the development is taking place? Good question. First of all, Marcia, thank you for, for, for your comments. It, it is hard, I think, to in, in a slide to try to capture the, the scope of what we're talking about. And so I, we, we always make efforts in that regard. And so I, I, I thank you for, for, for acknowledging it and, 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 and reiterating right, the importance of having that kind of material. Um, to, your, to your broader question, um, not specifically, right? Because again, one of the one of the guiding principles that we have for this project is to make something that's kind of transparent and understandable and easy to administer. And to have different requirements in every single individual neighborhood would be very hard for for us to administer, for for the development community to understand, for the neighborhood communities to understand what the obligations are. And so we do need to have kind of citywide standards. That said, we have baked in a couple of options, and we do have you'll see both in the linkage fee and in the fee and lieu components some distinctions and, and in those communities like Cherry Creek and downtown, um, there are higher on-site affordability requirements, higher linkage fees and higher in lieu, in lieu payments in those neighborhoods. And we have mechanisms to adjust what those neighborhoods are, right, based on, on data. So that they're not, it's not a static list of neighborhoods. We'll update it every couple of years to ensure that if a neighborhood becomes a new downtown or Cherry Creek, that standards will, will um, elevate in that regard. I hope that's a an answer to your question, Marcia, but if I didn't get it. Well, I just think that there may be an opportunity based on the zones um, that, you know, we're just being proactive and um, understanding that we want to have affordable housing looked at and also that it's affordable. I mean, that that's the, the streamlined question behind it is like, Okay, well, you're saying these are affordable housing, but who can afford affordable, right? Without some other programs designed to help you um, actually deliver on that. And I was hoping that that linkage fee would be used to help uh, negate that um, support for that particular community. Far too many times, affordable housing is not affordable. It is not. 
And when we look at all the programs, it just depends on your AMI, whether you qualify for these things or not. And if there's other programs that can help you be able to afford that, that unit. Um, and so my, my point behind that is, is how is this proposal um, different in terms of servicing the people that are in need of, you know, purchasing affordable housing, um, qualifying for some of these programs um, in the end? Because right now I'm looking here, it says this, you know, the old program, the old proposal is still in effect, I think, till June or something like that. Um, and, and then you're going to move into this great big proposal where everything is, is going to take place. My point in asking and saying that is, is how is this different um, from before? I mean, from the lessons you learned from before, um, the linkage yeah. fee and the fee in lieu of. How is this going to work better than the the last proposal? Sure. So thank you, Marcia, for, for the question. Um, the linkage fee is already kind of the law of the land and has been in place for, for five years. Um, what we've learned is that it, it, it's been great to generate resources, but what it hasn't generated is what we truly need, which are more affordable units interspersed into market rate development. So that is very much what, what will look differently this time. That is now the kind of primary function of the mandatory housing side of things. And so if you are a, a, a developer building 100 units, you can no longer kind of pay the linkage fee. You need to actually incorporate, um, you know, depending on the location and, and the tenure, right? And by the way, this applies to both rental and for sale housing, um, a, a percentage of your units within your community as affordable. And we've calibrated that to be the, the major kind of difference in outcome that we expect to see. And, and we've done that by introducing that policy and also calibrating our fee in lieu and linkage fees that we assess to a much higher basis, again, to point towards that, that outcome, which we most desire as part of this, this policy update. So that's in a nutshell, I think what we hope to see is the biggest change. Thank Thanks, you. I, I, I really appreciate I really appreciate you expounding on that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Masha. And I'll say really we're comparing. I think your comparison was inclusionary housing, not so much linkage fee to this. And I think, Brad, thank you for providing that clarity on what the difference is, especially to the increased fees um, and the fee in lieu. Tom, and then I'll look around the room and see if there's anyone else. Tom keeps moving. There you are. Okay. Good, good morning. Um, I just had a kind of a, a, a direct question pertaining to kind of the dissemination of, you know, what you just went over saying, you know, why is this different than it was before? Um, being Native American, you know, uh, we're used to a lot of social programs who, uh, you know, um, pay for most of the housing on reservations. And so coming to the city, uh, we have to rely on, you know, different kind of um, aid that comes along. So uh, we're kind of used to not uh, getting any input from, you know, you know, these kind of committees uh, when we're asked, you know, um, should we be able to, you know, use this service when we come to the city? Um, so overall, my question would be, you know, is there a plan to kind of um, update, you know, these relevant communities that we're speaking upon, um, you know, of, you know, you know, hey, this is different because of this, um, you know, and, you know, having a kind of a follow up, you know, maybe a one or two year kind of review of, you know, hey, this is what we're, we're finding in the data. This is what we're finding, you know, that it's working, not working, you know, and um, as said before, you know, there were a trial trial linkage fees, things that did not, you know, pan out as uh, anticipated. So, you know, um, that kind of, um, you know, leads towards, you know, the trust of all these communities here. Um, being Native American, we're um, all often left out a lot of things. Um, but, you know, we're most of the ones who are impacted, um, you know, by these policies. You know, um, being homeless in our homeland is, you know, kind of the tenants or what, you know, the actual facts are, you know, um, a lot of people come to the city for opportunity, but uh, they're coming to the city with um, new kind of um, skill sets that they have to learn with this aid. So, you know, having this information available for our community through uh, proper channels would be good for, you know, our community just to learn, 
A, that, you know, there are programs here that are, you know, uh, similar to tribal programs, um, and they are here to help, uh, you know, the, the majority of the Native American community in yeah. Colorado. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate that. And I, I saw Sabrina nodding along. So I know that, you know, our, our communications teams, both within HOST and CPD, are working hard on ensuring that we disseminate this information through as many different channels as we possibly can. And, and, and Thomas, the whole goal of the next couple of months, right, especially is that there are, if there are groups, existing meetings, existing organizations who have, you know, we're happy if you allow us to come and spend part of your agenda with you to talk through this and answer kind of specific questions. That's very much what we intend to do. Um, we're, we're doing everything we can to reach as many organizations, but there's of course always individuals and groups that, that we miss, um, e even if we don't intend to. And so feel free to share that with Sabrina, um, with myself, Thomas, my email is on the, I think at the end of the slide deck here that you can, you can have, um, wanna make sure that we're, we're getting in front of as many people as possible and hearing specific concerns. Hey, Thomas, thank you for that question. One quick point on that, and then I have a very brief question and I'll turn it over to Sabrina for um, the closing and the communications uh, present out. But, but Thomas, I, I know the MDHI year, year um, end report shared you know, the impacts for our housing stability for indigenous people, for black and brown folks who are enhanced. I do expect that within um, the EHA process and your transparency with data, Brad, that even though it's not specific that you're, you're looking at communities and their impacts and how they're benefiting the output from the data, whether it's through uh, HMIS or MDHI or the new dashboards that HOST are, is developing, we're going to work to make sure that those communities are called out. So if it's an uh, increase on black and brown communities from COVID or from gentrification or from um, 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 whatever displacement or housing stability, we're going to look at the dashboards to provide a little bit more of that. So hopefully Thomas um, as these dashboards are being developed in collaboration with CPD and host will have targets uh, communicating or illustrating how indigenous people are impacted and how this um, targeted um, piece for EHA within that specific um, center model um, of, for EHA yeah. that it's impacting um, housing st stability for folks in your community. So, uh, Sabrina, I'm sorry, I, 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 Sabrina or Jennifer Bias, would you want to respond to that. I mean, I think that's very much our intent. And so hopefully, yeah. you know, you will see that as part of our updated database and reporting methodologies, but. If it's not, I just added it to your intent, Brad. So <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. one quick question before we, before we roll to Sabrina for communications piece. I, I know this was not explicit. It may not be explicit or your ability to make it explicit, Brad, but very curious on your thoughts to incentives around flexibility and housing types. Uh, very micro um, discussion, but when you're thinking of cooperative housing or community land trusts, these are really great um, uh, um, places to, to support affordability. What are your thoughts on maybe having some more of a communication narrative paragraph, anything around how EHA is going to impact those two types of um, housing, in, having incentives for this type of housing flexibility. Does that make sure. sense? Um, I think so, yeah, Daryl, thank you. So one, again, you know, the kinds of developments that community land trusts are, are doing now would be exempt from these requirements, right? Because they are by definition meeting the, the goals of these incomes. So we don't wanna put further burden on them. And in fact, hopefully the incentives that we're making available to new development for compliance with these programs will help enhance their ability to to, to create new and creative and, and, and more affordable. But I'm saying like removing parking requirements and stuff like that. So enhanced in incentives for these type of amazing um, yeah. um, vectors. So I'm wondering if there is a curiosity around that within this plan. Uh, so I, I think you will see, Daryl, I'm happy to have conversations, but there are parking incentive reductions, height incentives that don't, that aren't limited to certain individual product types, right? And so they're, they're meant to be broadly applicable to, you know, and, and, and we do want to open up creativity. We also have an avenue for kind of negotiated outcomes, setting some guardrails for those creative solutions that we haven't thought of yet, right? Because there's all kinds of folks out there who are coming up with new and innovative ideas and we want to open the, the avenue for them to, to be successful within the confines of this program. And so it's, we're telling a line of, you know, understanding and, and, and applicability citywide, but also incorporating, you know, flexibility and creativity where we can. 
Brad, you're a trooper. You answered all those questions. You answered them all, <laughs> all, all, all morning. Great, great questions. Thanks, buddy. Thank you so many, but thank you so much for being here, being prepared, and then also providing us an opportunity to come back to you through your email and through some of these public outreach and discussion points. So I encourage uh, HASA members to attend some of these public uh, meetings. We're going to get a list of when and where um, for you to be a part of this dialogue through February. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to you, Sabrina, uh, for your comments, as well as to close the meeting. Great. Thanks so much, Daryl. Um, Katie, if you don't mind jumping to the very last slide, I just, for those of you who have a hard stop at 1130, I just want to quickly um, remind you that based on the new um, calendar that Daryl went over at the beginning of the meeting, go to the very, very last one for me. Next, that says next meeting. I just wanted to let you guys all know that that um, the next meeting will be from 10 to 11.30 on Friday, February 18th. There will be a discussion about governance um, that, that Daryl will lead, and then we will be doing a deep dive discussion into the housing opportunity pillar. So just wanted to make sure that you're all aware of that if you've got to jump off at 11.30 hard stop. So um, with that, I'll jump backward and go to the communications priorities. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I'll be really quick for those of you who can stay on. Um, just wanted to let you all know, if you go to the slide before that, Katie, um, we took a look, our, our communications and engagement team took a look at our 2022 action plan and all the things that our team said that they were gonna be doing in the coming year. And we picked out all of the things that we thought would require communications and engagement needs. And so we've put together our uh, plan for the year on all of the things that we're going to be doing. So I'll quickly kind of try to highlight for you some of the things in the different areas we're looking at, but we are going to be continuing to work on our overarching messaging of who we are, what we do, and have achieved. And we will be sharing all of these things out with you as we develop messaging um, so that you feel well informed and also like you have the talking points to go out and speak to the community about all of these things. Um, we're continuing to work on our internal communications with our staff. We have a number of audits that we're kind of expecting to come up this year. Um, the usual um, annual report that we do and the annual action plan will be part of our um, work this year as well as the budget. And then we always contribute our achievements to the state of the city um, when the mayor does that in June. Um, citywide uh, coordination, we're, we're leading on a citywide team on housing and homelessness where we bring other communications professionals to the table so that we can make sure that where our work is intersecting, we're talking with each other and making sure that we're all well informed and aligned in what we're saying. Uh, and then we'll also be working across the department. Um, we have lots of different teams who uh, touch our work in on House America and our ARPA funds the GO Bond. And so we'll be working with all of them to um, make sure we're communicating adequately about those efforts. In addition to that, we also are going to be uh, very much focused on our core value of equity and the um, ORESA survey that um, we do internally and how that work might guide others outside of the organization. That stands for Organizational Racial Equity Self-Assessment. Um, and then um, in operations, for the operations team, as you'll recall in that um, action plan, we talked a lot about, uh, and we've heard a lot today about dashboards. So we'll be working with um, Jennifer Bice's team on the dashboards and, and making sure the public knows how to use that tool. Um, we're working on a prioritization policy that you heard a little bit about today. Um, we've got procurement notice coming up. We're working on a regional conference that we used to do a housing conference and we were looking at trying to expand that to be more of a regional housing and homelessness conference with some of our partners. Um, and then from a communications and engagement lens, we're really working on um, planning and putting together our standards for how we do our engagement and outreach to the community. So we'll be sharing some of that with you. Um, Katie's also helping with our website redesign, which is going to be happening early this year. Um, and we're working really hard on segmenting our audiences so that we can do more with targeted emails and communications to certain uh, very focused audiences, as well as assessing our communications channels. So looking at things like, you know, should we be using social media? Is it working for us to use the citywide marketing team's social platforms? Um, how does our website work? Are we getting enough hits? Are there other things that um, tools that we could be using that would work better? Um, and then we've been doing a number of internal trainings, making sure that our staff and you all know how to work with the communications team so that if you have a need for things like talking points, we can help you. 
And then on the next slide, um, we have our priorities for each of our um, pillars. So under housing opportunity, um, sorry, I keep forgetting to correct this slide. It should say expanding housing affordability. Um, as you've heard, we're working closely with Brad and Annalise to get that all um, out to the public, communicated well, and on its march to city council. Uh, we have a preservation ordinance that we're going to be doing an update to later on this year. We're going to be promoting our housing programs. I heard a lot about this from you and Thomas. I think you just basically said it all um, that we really need to be doing a lot more to promote a lot of this work to various different communities. So we'll be doing that with both our housing programs and as you'll see in this housing stability pillar, um, all of our stability programs, which um, we just put out a new tenant rights guide, which is uh, really super duper helpful. Um, we'll be working with um, excise and licensing on the rental licensing program, um, putting out more information about our eviction, legal defense, and rent and utility assistance. And then also we're going to be focusing a lot on uh, outreach to the immigrant community for those stability programs. Um, we also will be working with the stability team on some income restricted for sale units communications. And then in homelessness resolution, uh, we just did the point in time count and we will again be focused on communicating about that uh, come summer when those results are out. We're getting ready to launch our second housing surge at the end of this month. So you'll be hearing more about that from us very soon. Uh, really excited about that. And then um, we are also working with all of our outreach teams on really diving in with them and finding out what resources um, would really help our outreach workers um, in, in their work day to day in terms of communication. So we have like an old guide that's a, a shelter and services guide that we have been asked to update, but we're really going to work with the outreach teams on what would be helpful tools for them. Um, we're also working on the communications around the regional recovery center that the governor has proposed in his budget. Um, the CIPRA program, as, as you know, um, is going to be coming out with a lot more information soon. And then um, also just really anticipating that at some point we will be doing a COVID step down and really thinking about how we communicate around some of those things. So those are the big areas that we will be communicating around. As always with communications, there are a ton of things that pop up that are unexpected, but these are the ones that our team is going to be proactively yeah. engaging um, with the rest of our department on these programs and making sure that we have full-blown strategic communications yeah. plans and all of the messaging and different materials that folks might need. So you will be hearing more from us about these as we develop that messaging. As I said, we'll be sharing that out with you and uh, hope that that will be helpful. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. Did we lose everybody? <laughs> we did, and we still have a whole crew on. So Sabrina, thank you so much for that. Any questions on communications from the board? Seeing none, any final comments from Britta? Thanks to everyone, and uh, thanks to Brad and Annalise for their presentation. Thanks, Sabrina, for laying out the many things we still have going on uh, and to get done. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks everyone for sticking with us six minutes over and thanks for a very engaged discussion. Thank you so much, Sabrina, for closing us out on, on the communication protocols and Katie for helping us with uh, getting to the meeting this morning. We thank you for all the work you do behind the scenes. So have a great weekend, everyone, and look forward to seeing you in February. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.